And uh, so we're going to receive the Lord's Supper today, and, uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about it. We're going to look in the scriptures about it, and then we're going to receive together. And receiving together is part of uh, the Lord's Supper. So the Lord's Supper, do this in remembrance of me. Let's look at a passage in Acts chapter 20, verse 7. And as you turn in there, I'm going to pray. Father, we thank you for this moment where we're gathered together as your body. We come, Lord, and we incline our ears to your mouth to hear your words. We thank you that your word is a light unto our feet, a lamp unto our path. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit that we have received that enlightens us. We ask you, Lord, for your encouragement, for your strength, and for wisdom. Help us to receive what you're saying to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 20, uh, verse 7. Now, on the first day of the week, what day is that, by the way? Some, some scholar in here, help me. The first day of the week is Sunday. Now, on the first day of the week, and according to the Hebrew reckoning in ancient Israel, they were numbered. The first day, the second day, the third day, and the seventh day would be Saturday. So the first day is Sunday when the disciples came together to break bread. That's the Lord's Supper. And so right away, even in the scriptures, we see that Christians are meeting on the first day, on Sunday, having the Lord's Supper together. Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them, and so then also they preached. So we have the there's the grace of God revealed in the preaching and the teaching of his word and in the receiving of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And they met together as a church on Sunday. And so Paul was ready to depart the next day and spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. And then that was just the intermission. Because this guy fell asleep and fell out the window and died. And they prayed for him and he was resuscitated, and then uh, he went and preached till, until daybreak. Y'all ready? <laughs> so, so there was a beam I saw. There's a fine line between a long sermon and a hostage situation. <laughs> and so Right away in the scriptures, we see that in the early church, while the apostles are ministering, there was a special importance attached in early Christianity to the fact that the whole community, the body of Christ, as Christine referred to earlier, should gather in one place. They would gather in one place. In fact, even uh, some early Christians would write about, uh, they, they discouraged separate gatherings. Uh, of course, there's you know, smaller gatherings, but, but that the ch whole church was to come together. And so already in the earliest times of the, the early Christian church, uh, they created for themselves a specifically Christian setting in which one day was specially marked out as the day for the church services, the Lord's Day. Which is the, when, the, when we say the Lord's Day, we're talking about Jesus Christ. And they're saying it's the Lord's Day because that's the day he rose again from the dead. So we meet on Sunday morning because this is the day that Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, we see that in Acts chapter 20, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16 too, that on the first day of the week, uh, collect your offering. And so we do that too. That's a part of uh, our religious worship, our spiritual worship. And uh, there's also an early uh, document, early church document, first century uh, called the Didache, which means the teaching of the Twelve. And I'm going to read you just a small passage from it. Uh, it's in chapter 14 of that letter. Uh, and verse 1, it says, And coming together on the Lord's day of the Lord, break bread and give thanks. By the way, there's another uh, ecclesiastical ecclesial uh, term for the Lord's Supper of Eucharist, which is a Greek word that means giving of thanks. Confessing beforehand your sins so that your sacrifice may be pure, and everyone having a quarrel with his fellow member, do not let them gather with you until they have reconciled so that your sacrifice may not be defiled. So notice the importance of stressing that we are to dwell together in unity, forgiving each other, right? Uh, dealing with issues, right? But I wanted you to notice right away that, again, uh, Sunday was... Uh, 
very early in the scriptures and then in the early church in the first century. We're talking the 100s. Um, but, I mean, so actually the second century. But it, it may have been, this may have been written as early as 70 A.D., the Didache. But from that moment early, uh, the Christians are meeting on Sunday. And one of the things they would do is have the Lord's Supper. And, uh, and so in the Didache, they quoted this from Malachi. For this is what was said by the Lord, in every place and time, offer me a pure sacrifice because I am a great king, says the Lord, and my name is great among the nations. So uh, Sunday is not the Jewish Sabbath or the seventh day. And that's not negated. That's still uh, the Sabbath. As far as the, the, the seventh day in his uh, in prophetic even uh, meaning there. But the Sunday of the church meeting together, uh, and originally they're all mostly Jewish, but it was in deliberate distinction from Judaism. The first Christians selected the first day of the week since on this day Christ had risen from the dead and on this day he had appeared to the disciples gathered together for a meal. So not only did he raise from the dead on Sunday, the first day of the week, but when the disciples were gathered together for a meal, Jesus came and ate with them. And so the Lord's Day of the first Christians was therefore a celebration of Christ's resurrection. So every Sunday they gathered together for a meal and uh, celebrated the resurrection of Jesus. So each Lord's Day was an Easter festival, and they hadn't yet started just celebrating like Easter once a year. Every Sunday was an Easter celebration. And so uh, sometimes this meaning of Sunday can be forgotten today by people. You know, they just know they go to church on, on Sunday. And, uh, and some Christians even, you know, there's denominations where they're going to meet on Saturday because that was the, the Sabbath, uh, the day God rested. And both are valid days. But er early in the New Testament, the Christians met and had the Lord's Supper on Sunday. And so we're dealing here with a specifically Christian festival day that was distinct from uh, what the Jews were doing. Because the Jewish believers in Christ were distinct from the, Ju the Judaism that didn't believe in Christ. And so, uh, and it derives its meaning from Christ's resurrection. And so this gives us an important hint as the basic Christian meaning of all gatherings of the early church for worship. And so in the very earliest period, um, you know, there wasn't a special name for the day, just first day of the week, according to the Jewish system of chronology. And uh, now by, by uh, the revelation, John calls it the Lord's Day. In the Didache, they're calling it the Lord's Day, the first day. Um, and so the Lord's Supper would be uh, celebrated and uh, eaten on that Sunday. And so the Lord's Supper is the, that sacrament or rite in which by the, the institution and word of Christ, the command of Christ, bread and wine are made to believers the communion of his body and blood and a memorial and pledge of his redeeming love. And so besides this designation, Lord's Supper, it's called the Lord's Table, the communion, uh, it's called uh, the breaking of bread, Eucharist or sacrament of the altar, and so this word sacrament, uh, sometimes uh, our, our churches, like our type of church, don't always use that word. But uh, sacrament uh, comes from the Latin. It's a form of religious act in which the actions and materials used are the channels by which God's grace is communicated, either actually or symbolically. The word sacrament is not used in most English versions of the Bible. It comes from the Latin sacramentum, which was the word for a soldier's oath of allegiance. The word also came to have the idea of mystery associated with it. In fact, it's the word mystery in the Greek that would be translated uh, uh, sacramentum in the Latin Vulgate, which was the Bible for a thousand years. And so this word also came to have the idea of mystery associated with it. And uh, so 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 
verse 7, he says, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. And so in the Latin Vulgate, that was translated sacramentum. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Isn't that cool? So Jerome uh, translated the Latin Vulgate, and so he translated the Greek word mysterion, that we have in English mystery, uh, by the word sacramentum. Christian practices such as baptism and the Eucharist were called mysteries in the early church, and they are still called that in the Greek Orthodox Church to this day. And, but because of Jerome's translation, it was natural for the Latin church to refer to these ceremonies as sacraments. So in the early Greek-speaking church, the term used for sacrament was mystery, which simply meant the sign of a sacred mystery of the faith. Later, this term was translated again into sacramentum, uh, uh, the term that originally meant uh, uh, a pledge made by a Roman soldier to be loyal to his post. And so it was a, uh, a promise of loyalty. And so in the early Greek-speaking church, uh, oh, I'm sorry, so Augustine he said that a, that a sacrament consists in a sign and the reality that the sign points to. For Augustine, the sign should not be confused with the reality of divine grace itself. Each sacrament possesses a visible sign. So baptism, there's a visual, visible uh, acting out. And when we eat the Lord's Supper, there's a visible act of eating. And so each sacrament possesses a visible sign and a word that explain the nature of divine grace received through it. And so when sacramentum, this word was adopted as an ordinance by the early Christian church, the Latin word sacer, holy, was brought into conjunction with the Greek word mysterion, a mysterious uh, act or rite. Sacramentum was thus given a sacred mysterious significance that indicated a spiritual potency. Isn't that cool? Let me say that again. Sacramentum was thus given a sacred, mysterious significance that indicated a spiritual potency. Potency has to do with capability, with power, with ability. And so this power was transmitted through material instruments and vehicles viewed as channels of divine grace and as benefits and ritual observances instituted by Christ. St. Augustine defined sacrament as the visible form of an invisible grace or a sign of a sacred thing. Similarly, St. Thomas Aquinas wrote that anything it, that is called sacred may be called sacramentum. It is made efficacious by virtue of its divine institution by Christ in order to establish a bond of union between God and man. In, uh, uh, also, the, the Lutheran and Anglican catechisms defined it as an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. And so this term is, uh, is a, a great expression for a sign or symbol of a sacred thing, occasion, or event imparting spiritual benefits to participants. So I'm preparing you that when we receive the Lord's Supper, this is an, an outward sign of an invisible spiritual grace that provides benefits to the receiver. The sacraments are an institution for the perpetuation of the union of God and man in the person of Jesus Christ. When we're baptized, we're baptized in identification with Jesus Christ. When we eat the, the body and blood of the Lord, we're participating in Christ. And so um, in the person of Jesus Christ, through the visible organization and constitution of the church, which was viewed as the mystical body of Christ, so there's an aspect in which when you partake of the Lord's Supper, you're coming into communion with Jesus Christ himself and the rest of his body. So, a simple and appropriate definition about this, these sacraments is to say that it is an external sign by which the Lord seals on our consciences his promises of goodwill toward us. in order to sustain our faith 
and we in turn testify our loyalty towards him as we participate in it. One of the things we do when we're baptized, we're testifying to our commitment and our loyalty to Christ. Each time we partake of the Lord's Supper, we're also pledging our loyalty to him as he committed himself to us both before himself and before angels as well as men, we may also define more briefly by calling it a testimony of the divine favor toward us, confirmed by an external sign with a corresponding attestation of our faith towards him. So also partaking of the Lord's Supper then is a, is a demonstration and an expression of our faith in his body and his blood and what that has accomplished for us. Amen? And so mysteriously, the sacraments are used by God to confirm divine promises to believers and are somehow the means by which the recipient enters into the truths which they represent. And so the eating of the bread and the drinking of the wine becomes this point of contact to release your faith in the promises God put into his body and his blood for you. And so, um, as St. Thomas said, that there, anything that had the, the mystery of, of God's gospel, his power, um, could be called a sacrament. And so, uh, but at some point, the, the kind of many churches, Eastern Orthodox, Anglican, Roman Catholic, they kind of decided on seven sacraments, but even within those seven, they established the two that were dominical, that had the dominion, that they, they were the highest sacraments. And some Protestant churches really only talk about two. And what are those two? <laughs> Baptism and the Lord's Supper. So a sacrament is a Christian rite that is recognized as being particularly important and significant. Um, there are various uh, views of, uh, on the existence of them, the number and the meaning, but usually all Christians consider the sacraments to be a visible symbol of the reality of God as well as a channel for God's grace. That it... Um, And so, again, the two primary sacraments are baptism and the Lord's Supper. And uh, Jesus himself very clearly, personally uh, commands us concerning baptism in the Great Commission and uh, to eat his body and drink his blood in several places. And those are two sacraments that are for everyone. It's a part of your... Uh, they're, they're both initiatory sacraments. So let's talk about those sacraments that are recognized as seven. There's the sacraments, and they're kind of grouped in different kinds. The, the sacraments of initiation are baptism, the Lord's Supper, and confirmation. Now, at confirmation, oil would be anointed on the recipient, and uh, the Holy Spirit is to come upon that person. So in a, as a Pentecostal church, we definitely believe in this. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so these are all sacraments of initiation. Then there are sacraments of healing. One is healing for the soul, confession and repentance. That's reconciliation. And the anointing with oil for those who are physically sick. And so we believe in that, don't we? So it's for anyone who would be sick. Then there is sacraments of vocation. Matrimony. That's a thing uh, Jesus has told us to do originally from the beginning. And so there is a, an impartation of God's grace when a man and a woman are married. And they become one flesh. And so do you notice there that there's mystery in there? How does that happen? Uh, yeah, it happens, though. Uh, uh, but involved with any of these sacraments is the faith of the participant in the promise of God. So, uh, so sacraments of vocation 
are only for those who choose to enter into this vocation. You with me? Uh, you can be a Christian uh, and receive baptism and the Lord's Supper and be single. Um, so matrimony is the first type of the sacrament of vocation. So what's holy orders? When you go into the ministry, when uh, hands are laid upon and you and a, a, a man or a woman of God and they're ordained into the ministry through the laying on of hands. So this is a sacrament, uh, but it's uh, only for those who are called into the ministry, a, a five-fold ministry gift. So those are what are generally accepted as the seven sacraments uh, in, in many churches. Now, Protestant uh, churches, more focus. Now, not everybody will call them sacraments, but most all Christian churches do them. We believe in, in marriage. We believe in uh, ordaining people for the ministry. Um, so... The other ones are not on the same level as uh, the, the two dominical sacraments because they're for everybody and, and they're necessary in your witness and testimony for Christ. So sacraments signify God's grace in a way that is outwardly observable. You know, even in a, a, a wedding, which I did a wedding yesterday, two people come together and they exchange rings, they exchange vows. And then they kiss. And so there's a spiritual grace that is invisible, but there's an outwardly observable thing to participants. And so now some churches that are, would be considered sacramental uh, think that there's power just in the sacrament itself having nothing to do with the person administering it or any faith on the receiver. We don't believe that. We believe that faith is involved when you partake of the Lord's Supper or when you're baptized, that faith is required. And so ultimately, biblical bases exist for each of the additional sacraments, and most churches practice them whether or not they regard it as sacraments. Again, baptism and the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper are often referred to as dominical sacraments in order to recognize their special status as instituted by Christ himself and that they're for everyone. And so baptism and the Lord's Supper are the two essential sacramental acts of the church. They are the acts ordained by Christ as a critical means by which the life and witness of the church is sustained. The church is the gathering of the baptized. The Lord's table is the point of intense encounter. Let me say that again. The Lord's supper, the Lord's table, is a point of intense encounter between the risen Christ and the people of God. And so these are also very communal acts means by which the church nurtures its union with Christ and its communion with each other in Christian community. They are the means by which the church lives in dynamic communion with the ascended Lord Jesus Christ and knows experientially the grace of God. So the reformers uh, in the Reformation found distinguishing marks of sacraments, number one, in their institution by Christ, in their being enjoined by him upon his followers, and they're being bound up with his word and revelation in such a way that they become the expressions of divine thoughts, the visible symbols of divine acts. And as baptism and the Lord's Supper, their unique place in the original revelation justifies us in, in separating them from all other rites and ceremonies. Um, and so they're a part of the historical gospel. They're classed together together. Um, in the baptism, uh, they, and, and, and the Lord's Supper are two of the most distinctive rites, even from the Old Covenant. In baptism, there is forgiveness, cleansing, and spiritual quickening. Those are associated with baptism. And with the Lord's Supper, is declared to be a participation in the body and blood of Christ. And so when Jesus wanted to explain to his disciples what his death was all about... He didn't just give them a theory. He gave them a meal. Uh, St. Cyril of Alexandria 
said, as two pieces of wax fused together make one, so he who receives Holy Communion is so united with Christ that Christ is in him and he is in Christ. The Lord's Supper is the central act of Christian worship. It is a prophecy, a pledge, and a prelude to that supper table of the Lamb, the wedding supper of the Lamb, when we shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of our Father. So there are three historical reenactments of communion. There is the Passover. There is the manna. And there is the showbread that was in the tabernacle. The bread that was in the holy place inside the tabernacle. And so Jesus is the manna, the living bread come down from heaven, this supernatural provision to feed us. He is the showbread in the tabernacle, in the temple, that was holy bread. And he is the Passover lamb. So five elements of communion, unle unleavened bread, the juice from the grape, the assembly uh, of Christians on Sunday was practiced by the early church. And so the presence of Jesus has been understood. Remember, Jesus said, where two or three of you gather in my name, there will I be. And concerning the Lord's Supper, Christians have always understood that the presence of the Lord is there. It's been interpreted in different ways, some actual, some figurative, or some symbolical senses. But... Uh, as the memorial before God of the sacrificial offering on the cross once and for all, that's always been accepted. And so the Passover was at once a covenant recalling and a covenant renewing sacrifice. And the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper as corresponding to it was instituted at the time of the Passover's yearly observance and of the death of the true Paschal Lamb of whose death it is interpreted the value and the significance. And so the Lord's Supper is like baptism in possessing all the elements of a sacrament. Baptism is an initiatory sacrament. It te testifies to a primary identification with Christ, without which one is not a Christian at all, while the Lord's Supper is a continuing sacrament. So the Lord's Supper is an initiatory rite, but it's also a continuing sacrament. It, we continue to be nourished by the Lord's Supper. And even as baptism is communal, as you see someone else be baptized, you're participating in that also, remembering your own uniting with Jesus Christ through baptism. So the Lord's Supper is a continuing sacrament meant to be observed again and again, as often as you drink it, as Jesus said, throughout the Christian life. And so let me say this to you, that the character of the Lord's Supper is seen in its past, its present, and its future significance. We look at the past of what Jesus did on the cross for us. We remember his death, his burial, his resurrection. And it's present that when we eat, we have his promise to be present with us, that he will come and sup with us, that we are to be nourished presently when we receive it. And we're also rehearsing a future dinner the wedding supper of the Lamb. And so, uh, first, it has past reference to Christ's death, which we remember and honor. It's a memorial. Second, it has a present reference to our corporate feeding on him by faith, with implications also for how we treat our fellow believers. So let's read this. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17. Now, in giving these instructions, I do not praise you since you come together not for the better but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. See, there should not be divisions among you. And in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. 
Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in eating each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. In other words, some people are being gluttons with what they brought, and they're eating it themselves and not sharing. What, do you not have houses to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. For I received from the Lord that which I saw also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body. So here we have a little bit of mystery. He hands the disciples bread and he says, Take, eat, this is my body. We don't have to, we don't believe in transfiguration, transubstantiation, yeah, trans yeah, transubstantiation. But we don't have, and, and the early church didn't, they just left it a mystery. But they recognized that Jesus said, this is my body. That when you eat the bread, you should uh, reckon that you are eating his body. Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And then verse 27, the subheading here we have is examine yourself. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. In other words, not realizing, not recognizing that this is the Lord's body that I'm partaking in. So there's two ways someone could do that by not recognizing that I'm partaking of the, the sacrifice of Christ, that I'm being nourished by his body and his blood, and not understanding what that means, and so then failing to receive what that is. Then also, by failing to discern the Lord's body as one, if I'm mistreating the body, and then I partake in Christ's body in which he laid his life down for me, and I'm not laying my life down for my brothers and sisters, that's also to partake unworthily or to fail to discern the Lord's body, to not recognize that as I partake of Christ, I've been joined to you. And to forgive, yes, as he has forgiven me. In fact, Jesus said, if you don't forgive others, he won't forgive you. So uh, verse 30, check, check this out. He says, for this reason... The failure to discern the Lord's body, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. That means dead. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. In other words, recognize the value of each other. Value each other as much as you value Christ. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment, and the rest I will set in order when I come. And so uh, third, again, is the future reference as we look ahead to Christ's return. So that first Sunday after Jesus rose from the dead and they gathered for a meal and Jesus met them in that meal and ate with them. And so every time we're partaking of the Lord's Supper, we're doing so with an expectation of him meeting with us to be present with us in the meal invisibly but we're also looking forward to a time when he meets presently visibly with us we're looking forward to that meal to come and so preliminary self-examination to make sure one's frame of mind is as it should be is advised as we just read um, so let me tell you, in the scriptures, there is one of the oldest prayers that was prayed after receive, or at receiving, after receiving the Lord's Supper. It's the, and it's in the scriptures, in 1 Corinthians 16, it's left in the Aramaic and in the book of Revelation. It's the Maranatha prayer. And it was associated with the Lord's Supper. And so they would pray it 
after receiving the Lord's Supper, come, Lord Jesus. It's expecting, again, for him to come and meet us at that meal. And so let's read this. Uh, Revelation 22, verse 20. And this is the end of the book of Revelation. Our subheading here is, I am coming quickly. This is what Jesus said. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. In Aramaic, Maranatha. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. This is also in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And remember, at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 16, he talked about on the first day of the week. He talks about the, the meeting on Sunday. And then here at the end of the chapter, in verse 21, I, Paul, add this final greeting with my own hand. If anyone does not love the Lord, does not have a friendly affection for him, and is not kindly disposed toward him, he shall be accursed. Our Lord will come. In other words, there's a day coming when he will come, and if people aren't right with him, that's not going to be good. They need to repent. He says, our Lord will come, Maranatha. The grace, favor, and spiritual blessing of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love, that true love growing out of sincere devotion to God be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. So again, Paul leaves this. He's writing in, in Greek, but he leaves this prayer of Maranatha in Aramaic. And so that's saying, uh, Lord, come. And it's a prayer asking him to come. From the Didache that I referred to earlier, that letter that may have been written as early as 70 AD, uh, this Maranatha prayer was uh, said in particular at the end of the meal of the Lord's Supper. And so the fact that this prayer is handed down by Paul, untranslated from Aramaic, and that it continued in its original form until the time of the composition of the Didache shows the extraordinarily important role which this oldest prayer of the early Christian community must have played. In the Maranatha prayer, we come right down to the specifically Christian element in early uh, prayer, an element which connects closely with the fact that the day of the Christian service of worship is the day of Christ's resurrection. On this day, Christ appeared at a meal with the disciples. So now he ought to appear again in the Christian celebration of the meal, since where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. This presence in the spirit in the congregation is an earnest or a down payment of his coming at the end. So we experience his present invisibly when we eat, but we're looking forward to the time where he will visit us again. He will return and we'll have a meal together called the wedding supper of the Lamb. So that's why after the meal, the early church would say, come Lord Jesus, come meet us and let's have a meal together again in person with you. Isn't that cool? So this ancient prayer points at the same time backwards to Christ's appearance on the day of his resurrection and to his present appearance at the Lord's Supper and looks forward to the appearance at the end which is often represented by the picture of the messianic meal. In all three cases, a meal is involved. Therefore, the Maranatha is above all a Eucharistic prayer. In German, so any German speakers in here, there's a German grace, Komm Herr Jesu sei unser Gast. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. And so... That is a faithful translation of Maranatha. So, as a Ger if you can if you can speak this German, when you pray at a meal with other Christians, you can say, "Komm, Herr Jesus, sei unser Gast, be our guest, put our service to the test." <laughs> and so, look at the next screen here. There is the invitation to come to the wedding supper of the Lamb. 
You are invited to Christ's banquet. You must RSVP by confessing that you're a sinner, repenting, and receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, confessing Jesus as the Lord, and ask Christ to forgive you since he did everything necessary to forgive your sins by dying for you and being resurrected. Then you will dine with him forever. And so we have anticipatory meals in Sunday on church awaiting his return. Amen? Let's stand up. So we're going to get ready to receive the Lord's Supper today. And let me just read this to you real quick from John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse uh, 53. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. But the opposite is also true. If you do eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man, then you have life in you. And so I want you to recognize that as you partake today, you're receiving of his life that nourishes you, nourishes your spirit. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides, abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. So I'm going to invite you to come to the front to receive the elements of communion. We're going to invite you to come, starting with the first row. 